Okay, welcome to Genomine Grand Rounds. My name is Dr. David Krauss. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Genomind. And Genomind, as you know, is a pharmacogenetic testing company. And we talk about the Mental Health 360. We know that environment, lifestyle, and experience all contribute to uh, mental health and mental illness, but we wanna talk about the missing piece of the puzzle. And the missing piece of the puzzle is genetics. And so family history, genetic predispositions, brain chemical balance, metabolic genes, and pharmacogenetics all contribute to mental health, uh, mental illness, and the resolution of mental illness. Today, we're very pleased to have Dr. Stephen Sacklad present Grand Rounds on the missing piece of the prescribing puzzle. Dr. Saklad is uh, a board certified psychiatric pharmacist and a doctor of pharmacy. He's a clinical professor of pharmacotherapy at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Um, he is an adjoint professor at the School of Medicine at the University of Texas. And he uh, received his doctor of pharmacy degree at the University of Southern California, after which he did a National Institute of Mental Health Fellowship. And he has been in, at the University of Texas since that time. He was the first clinical pharmacist employed by the Texas Health and Human Services Department. Um, and he's been in San Antonio for several decades. Uh, interesting fact is that Dr. Sacklad is the father of triplet sons. Um, and he's had some interesting stories, but more relevant for this meeting is that he is a principal or co-investigator for many studies regarding the efficacy in pharmacy and pharmacology of drugs to treat um, mental illness and psychopharma, psychopharmacologic drugs. So we will um, hear from Dr. Sacklad for about 30 minutes, after which we're going to turn it over to Dr. Daniel Dowd, who's the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Genomine. And Dan's gonna be speaking about GenMed Pro. GenMed Pro is our new and rebranded digital tool that you may have known as GT. Uh, we've added some incredible features to it. And for that reason, we basically have rebranded it and relaunched it. You will find it on your clinician portal when you uh, go into your Genomine portal. And I think you, you will find it a very, very useful tool for your patients. So with that introduction, I'm very uh, pleased and uh, proud to turn it over to Dr. Sackler. Let me stop sharing my screen and Steve can take over. Okay, Steve. Thank you very much. I don't think I'm, I'm still shows I am video muted. We can hear you. I need to switch. Okay, I will just go to sharing screen then. And I have to bring the right window to the front. Okay, are you sure, seeing the correct screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking uh, today for just a few minutes about phenoconversion, the missing piece of the prescribing puzzle. Here are my uh, interests so you can get an idea of of what I'm involved in and what might be my biases. My goals and objectives are first to define phenoconversion, look at pharmacokinetic interactions, pharmacogenomic interactions, and then combined interactions. And I can make my slides available as a PDF afterwards. If you contact Genomind, I will uh, provide them a link that they can give you and you can get all my slides later. So first, phenoconversion. And when we begin this, we need to make sure we have a common understanding of some terminology. Pharmacokinetics, everybody's familiar with the word, but a lot of people don't realize that's what your body is doing to the drug. And pharmacodynamics is what your drug is doing to your body. So those are important. And then a little PTSD for everybody from biochemistry. <laughs> this is the uh, uh, intermediary metabolism map showing you everything. 
And if you look at it, if you go back into here, you got the citric acid cycle and all of the things we're talking about are the metabolism components that are involved in this uh, uh, intermediary uh, production of neurotransmitters, energy, everything else. Now, one of the main places we focus, because that's where the light is, that's where we have knowledge, is the cytochrome P450 drug metabolism system. But it's not just a drug metabolism system. True, 75% of all the drugs we use are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, but also there's a large number of things that this vast system of metabolic enzymes does that are unrelated to drugs. So phenoconversion itself is the change in drug response due to drug interactions. So we have a genetic predisposition. Uh, this involves the disease you actually have or a susceptibility to disease that's been caused by environmental stressors or conditions in the setting of your genome. You have the response to things in your genome, and this is how you respond to the drug, including adverse effects and efficacy. And then you have how you can move the drug around and eliminate it from your body. Uh, sometimes this involves activation of the drug, a pro-drug becomes active, or also where you metabolize and remove the drug and clear it from your body. Second, you have drug interactions. These are pharmacodynamic interactions where we have a change in the response and adverse effects of the drug, as well as the more commonly observed and understood pharmacokinetic uh, interactions, which involve changes in the metabolic processes of induction and inhibition. And finally, these combine and give you the output, which is what we're actually trying to optimize. So let me give you a few selected, up, uh, selected uh, psychotropic substrates. These are things that are picked by the FDA as targets. So there are the ones that are in the middle column. Those are the moderately sensitive substrates. They cause a between twofold and less than fivefold increase in the area under the curve, the total amount of the drug in the body. And then on the right, you have highly sensitive substrates. These are more than a fivefold increase in area under the curve. So you can see that we have a large effect from CYP1A2 on clozapine, but it's a much larger effect on some of the other drugs we might be concerned about caffeine, duloxetine, melatonin, rameltion, and tasmeltion. And then you can see the other enzyme metabolic pathways here and which of the psychotropics are substrates of that pathway. Now we've known about different isoforms of the different enzymes, different structural forms of the enzyme that have different amounts of capacity. Enzymes can differ in the maximum rate of, of production of metabolite from uh, the, pro from the, or rather products from the uh, um, original molecule. And they can also differ on what the half saturation point is, the, the KM of that enzyme system. Uh, because there are different forms of each of these enzymes, we can observe differences in the clearance rate. This is an example for metoprolol back from uh, eight years ago now in 2013, Blake showed that metoprolol had significantly different clearances depending on whether you were a extensive metabolizer, the wild type of the enzyme, an intermediate metabolizer, one of the partially defective forms of the enzyme or a poor metabolizer, where you had a fully defective form of the enzyme and the elimination was carried out by some other mechanism. Now, I use this example because it also shows that the different um, isomers of metoprolol, there's an R and an S isomer. The S is the cardioselective beta-1 blocker. The R isomer is the non-selected beta-1 beta one and two blocker. And you can see that 
the enzyme has differential effects on these two different isomers of the same molecule. So we have a lot of detail that is important about how fast these drugs can go through different metabolic pathways. Now, just to give you an idea, this is the FDA's list of pharmacogenomic information. And it's hard to read on the slide, but you probably can see it because despite the fact that we're in a pandemic isolation, you're all looking at a screen that's only at two feet from you instead of a screen that's 40 feet in front of you in a lecture hall. So you probably can read this, but it gives you all of these different psychotropic drugs and whether the pharmacogenomic labeling is because of adverse reactions or clinical pharmacology changes or contraindications and all the way through. So the FDA has a great deal of information on this. And you can, in fact, just do a search on FDA pharmacogenomic information and pull this right up. Now, the place where I usually go, there's, there are several resources here for pharmacogenetic information. This is the Clinical Pharmacogenetic Implementation Consortium, or CPIC. This is now a, a, an accreditation requirement for education in a number of, of health professions. I'm most familiar with pharmacy, and we are accredited based on whether or not we actually teach pharmacogenomics now. And there's a number of levels that the uh, CPIC consortium uh, assigns to different uh, areas where they've investigated. The bottom is where they start investigating a preliminary at level four, then they go to level three. And then <clears throat> when they move up to level two, they begin to have enough evidence to start uh, developing guidelines. And then the CPIC guidelines are at level one or one A or one B. So they now have 25 guidelines uh, this involves over 20 genes, 46 drugs, 10 of which are psychotropics. There's actually many more psychotropics than that because some of them are assumed in some label like TCA or SSRI. But you can see that there's a large number of these drugs that are uh, labeled with guidelines by CPIC and have implementation of recommendations for how to handle these drugs based on the pharmacogenomic information that you should be looking at. Now let's take a look at some of the pharmacokinetic interactions. First of all, there are a number of mechanisms that alter metabolic activity. So looking at the upper left, we have substrates. So these are different metabolic pathways and the drugs can, are, that are the substrates of these pathways can go through different pathways depending if the pathway is blocked. Um, if it's blocked, then you can't go through that pathway. If you have a poor metabolizer at some pathway, the drug will go through some other mechanism to be eliminated from the body. If it didn't, it would just build up forever. Uh, next on the uh, upper right, we have genetics. Now we have polymorphisms, different versions of the same enzyme different versions of CYP2D6 or uh, other enzymes. And these have different activities. They normally have reduced activity in the different versions of the enzyme. Sometimes we have two versions of the enzyme that are both equally active. Normally you get one copy from each of your parents. So everybody normally has two copies of each allele. Each of these alleles of course can be different. So you can have two wild type, fully active versions of the enzyme. You can have a poor metabolizer and a highly active version, and you can be an intermediate metabolizer. You could have two partially active versions and et cetera. Now, some individuals can have extra copies. We were doing a study on metabolism and one of our um, supposed volunteers, which was actually a co-investigator on the study, who of course she volunteered, uh, blew us out of the water on metabolic rate. When we did genetics on her, we found that she had three copies of that pathway. Inhibitors, uh, can, and that's the lower right, uh, can compete with the substrate or block the enzyme. 
they can be either reversible or irreversible. Remember back in biochemistry, you had irreversible or reversible enzyme inhibitors. That's exactly what we're talking about here. These generally have very rapid onset. If I give you an inhibitor, it blocks the pathway, it's done. Moving over to the bottom left, we have inducers. These are due to usually increased production of the enzyme. And this would then require protein synthesis, and this would then have a slow onset. Now, the FDA has many resources on metabolic drug interactions, one of which is shown here, and this is guidance that is developed for drug development to give people an idea of what they're required or supposed to test against to be able to develop the requirements for getting a drug approved and it goes into the product label. So if you wanna get a drug on the market, you have to test certain substrates against certain inhibitors and inducers in the presence of these inhibitors and inducers and see if you have a sufficiently large change in the metabolism of that drug, usually measured as the peak concentration or Cmax and the amount of drug in the body at steady state, which would be the area under the curve. If you, those two are outside, usually 20% from the mean without the inhibitor or the inducer, then that drug gets labeling about a warning about that. Let me just give you one clinical example. I only have a half hour, so I can't go into a million of these. Heather is a 24-year-old woman with treatment refractory schizophrenia. Uh, she was stable on clozapine, 600 milligrams at bedtime, and she had a steady state clozapine plasma concentration, actually a serum concentration, whatever he calls it, a CP, 392 nanograms per milliliter. The normal range would be 350 to about 1,000. I have had people respond well outside that range, but that's a different talk. Heather has some, or ha, ha, the psychiatrist observed the patient, Heather, to have some obsessive compulsive symptoms. So he ordered fluvoxamine 50 milligrams every night time uh, was started. Uh, the following week, she began to complain about having no energy and the nursing staff observed her to be somnolent. She was trying to take naps all day. And uh, that's when I got notified to go take a look at her again. And I said, let's get a close of bean concentration tomorrow morning. And we'll see if there's something going on with the drug because I know that fluvoxamine might be a problem. Her clozapine concentration came back a couple of days later at 1,207 nanograms per mil, about three and a half, four times her previous concentration. So what happened? We had a drug interaction. If you take a look at the metabolic drug interactions for antipsychotics, you can see clozapine at the top of the table. CYP1A2 is inhibited by, you know it, fluvoxamine. And because of this, it greatly increased the concentration of clozapine, which then had to fall back on other metabolic pathways for its elimination. And you can see all of these here. This is actually from, a artic from an article that I uh, co-authored with uh, a bunch of colleagues uh, that was out uh, about two years ago. I have a newer article um, about uh, uh, medications, uh, almost the same group of people. Uh, Christoph Carell is again the lead author uh, that was out in CNS Drugs this month. These are the metabolic drug interactions for antidepressants. Uh, this is from a table by David Flockhart. Unfortunately, it's not getting updated, but it's just a really good example. I updated it with a few extra drugs more recently, and you can see that there's three uh, rows, substrates, inhibitors, and inducers, and the columns are the different cytochrome P450 pathways. Okay, so you can see that this is really uh, an important area uh, that people need to pay attention to. Uh, in fact, those are the things that usually wind up getting warned by the drug interaction programs. Now, the drug interaction programs 
are always alarming in how they actually get around to telling you things. And you can adjust the sensitivity of those programs. And usually people have them basically turned off because otherwise they alarm on, on really insignificant interactions. Now, there's a number of things that can alter this besides drug interactions. You can have disease state interactions as well. So here is just an example that inflammation may decrease the activity of metabolic pathways. Uh, we know that, that uh, from our own data that phenytoin, and if you go dig this up, it's back in the 1980s, but phenytoin plasma concentrations will increase if we give you influenza vaccine. Okay, so there's an interaction right there. The activity of the phenytoin uh, was the, the metabolic uh, capacity for phenytoin was decreased by influenza vaccine. Here we're seeing that the inflammation can alter uh, a number of, of pathways. 3A4 seems to be the most affected by inflammation. That's the one that destroys the kinetics in phenytoin as well. And the pa pattern of downregulation by cytochrome P450 isoforms was dependent on the inflammatory stimulus. So complicated again. Pregnancy, hardly inflammation, but causes a gigantic number of changes. And here we can see the changes in the metabolism of dextromethorphine to, its, uh, to one of its metabolites that's dependent on cytochrome P450 2D6. And you can see there's a significant change in extensive metabolizers, the uh, darker burnt orange bars from pregnant to non-pregnant, that the pregnancy reduced the activity, and also heterogeneous extensive metabolizers what I would now call an intermediate metabolizer, but this is an old article, you can see an even larger change. Now, metabolic capacity changes over one's lifetime as well. So you can see, uh, this is from a couple of my colleagues as well. I'm not on this paper at all. This is just being published in uh, 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 the uh, Child Psych uh, Journal. And uh, you can see that these enzyme activities are very low in a fetus and as you're born, and then they change over your lifespan and then tend to decrease as you get older. Some of the people listening may have noticed that they can't drink coffee, like I'm drinking right now, uh, after noon, or they don't get to sleep. I am apparently one of those people blessed with uh, high activity on CYP1A2, because I can have a double espresso and go right to sleep at bedtime. So not everybody is affected. Some of us are affected more than others. Now let's look at pharmacogenomic information. This of course is the main theme of, of GenomeMind. They look at this extensively and produces many of the results many of you are familiar with. So we're gonna take a look here. And first I'm gonna look at pharmacodynamic effects of genes, a little off the beaten path. There are many things that cause long QT syndrome. Uh, QT prolongation risk factors are listed here. Um, this will be on the test, of course, so you need to memorize this entire list. I am joking. If you don't know I'm joking, now you do. Okay, so this list really could be boiled down into the mechanisms we're concerned about with drug interactions. Uh, QT prolongation is caused by a blockage of one or more of three cation channels in the uh, heart. The uh, inward potassium rectifier, the inward potassium slow channel, and there's a sodium channel. Almost all of the medications that cause acquired long QT syndrome block the inward potassium rectifier, which is produced by the gene HERG. Uh, if you don't know what HERG stands for, it's human ether agogo. I didn't make this up, I just give the talk. Uh, other causes of acquired long QT syndrome that don't go through IKR, uh, they disrupt the uh, KCNH2 potassium channel, uh, arsenic contaminating and fluoxetine. Uh, there's an inward calcium channel, 
which is antimony, um, which remember is an element. Uh, nobody ever remembers that the symbol for antimony is SB. You can win bets on that all the time if you ever go to bars and remember going to bars and, and you could never, nobody would ever do that because you'd never get a date at your bar. Okay, and then there's also cisapride, which is now basically not marketed, available by special request, but off the market because of, of a failure to pay attention to drug interactions that caused the plasma concentration to rise so much that it caused QT prolongation problems. Janssen pulled this off of marketing. It's still available if you need it. So some other pharmacodynamic impacts that we might be concerned about involve rash when people from Southeastern Asia, the highest rate of this uh, HLA antigen is in the Philippines, an area where most people don't think of as Southeast Asia, but genetically, HLA B star 1502, that's the highest concentration of people. A uh, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine and lycarbazepine, which is not labeled for this yet, but carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine are, dramatically increases your risk of Steven Johnson syndrome and is standard of care. We also have the serotonin transporter gene, SLC6A4. Um, and this has differential effects, whether you have the long version of the gene or the short version. The serotonin receptors, serotonin 2A uh, has different isoforms, also serotonin uh, 2C. And these cause differential effects on weight gain, for example. So let's take a look just at that. Uh, this is data from Chen um, from a number of, well, no, well, two years ago now. So it's old data in, in the world we live in where, where things change every three hours. Uh, this is old data from last year. So you can see that body mass index change is associated with which of the two versions of the serotonin 2C gene someone carries. This is after six weeks of um, clozapine, one BMI unit is significant, okay? So you look at men and women, and what they analyzed in the uh, data that I show on the right was there was a significant difference about whether you were a, a homozygous CC genotype or a heterozygous CT or a homozygous T genotype. Now, they just pointed out the whole thing but they also gave you men and women in this graph. And you can see that basically there's no difference for women, but there is a substantial clinically significant difference for men. The analysis on the right is for the entire population, not men or women. Now I'm down to six minutes and hoping to wrap up a little faster. Let's look at the combined interactions. This is really the phenoconversion, where drug and genetic information need to be combined to see that the metabolic pathway to begin with was of intermediate metabolic capacity, perhaps, and then the drug interaction reduced it to poor metabolic capacity. Or you might be a full wild-type version of the enzyme, and then the drug interaction shut that pathway down much like we saw in the case of the patient that had clozapine and then we added fluvoxamine, it shut the pathway down and the concentrations of clozapine went way up and had clinical impact on the patient. So without knowing both pieces of this puzzle, without knowing the genetics and the drug interactions and combining them, we don't have enough pieces to be able to see what's happening. So this gives us a lot of clinical opportunities. And just to give you a little more graphic illustration of this, inhibitory drug interactions are converting you from being an extensive metabolizer. The dump truck from Caterpillar is the largest dump truck in the world. Uh, you'll notice that the guy standing in front of it, he has a stairway to get up to the cab. And you give somebody an inhibitory drug interaction and this large capacity 
extensive metabolizer is reduced down to a four, a poor uh, metabolizer, which is like the guy with the small bobcat on the right. So understanding phenoconversion is really critical to understanding drug, metabol drug metabolism in real clinical care where you don't have somebody on a single drug. Um, most of my patients at San Antonio State Hospital are on multiple medications. Many of them are on more than 10. It alarms me all the time, but they have multiple disease states and they wind up on multiple medications to treat them. I have patient, patients that are uh, psychotic. They have a psychotic bipolar disorder. So they're on medications for preventing mania. They're on medications for bipolar depression to stop them from, from staying in their bipolar depression. And then they also might be on Lamotrigine as well to prevent cycling. But they also have hypertension. They also have dyslipidemia. All of these things are going on in the person at the same time. One of my patients is just like that description. They also have a seizure disorder. So they wound up on valproate with Lamotrigine, which is another large drug interaction to pay attention to. So things can get very complicated and you need to understand all of these things in each of your patients to do a good job treating them. Now, we also have enzyme induction. So you can go from having extensive metabolizers, wild type version of the enzyme, and then you can have enzyme induction, something I haven't really dwelled on much yet. And I can move you to being a phenotypic ultra metabolizer. I can induce that pathway. I have uh, patients that have been on medications where the concentrations have been dropped out because of induction. I, we used to measure um, all the antipsychotics routinely at San Antonio State Hospital, and the one Navane or thiothixine um, actually is a very interesting drug. I can't hardly get it anymore, but it's a very interesting first-generation antipsychotic. And in the presence of carbamazepine, the plasma concentrations of thiothixine become undetectable, and I push the dose up four times the upper limit of normal, from 60 to 240 a day couldn't even detect the drug. The patient looked wildly psychotic. So clinically, they were not well at all. Okay, so watch out for enzyme induction as well. All of these pieces need to be pulled together. So if you look, this is from an article by Klomp that's just out uh, at the end of 2020. I'm not even sure if it's um, available in the printed version of uh, Journal of Clinical Medicine yet, but this is an illustration of looking at the drug or prodrug, because the drug might be a prodrug that's converted into the active form, plus concomitant medication on the upper left, uh, the prodrug or drug in the middle, which is normal, and then in the presence of comorbidities. And you can see the little graphs at the bottom of how everything shifts. It's a very nice review article. Finally, uh, phenoconversion should be a major consideration during medication reviews. And as you look at this, uh, there's a few quotes I pulled out of this article. Um, and uh, the, probably the most important is the bottom one. Providers and patients must be aware that phenoconversion should be a major consideration in medication reviews. Even a small number of concomitant medications can render genotype guided phenotypes incorrect resulting in over-prescribing and dangerous prescribing cascades. And I'd add to that the induction scenario of inadequate prescribing. Finally, last slide I'm gonna be using today. This is from one of my graduate students' a thesis, which if you go to the Theses Reservoirs, you can go find it, but uh, otherwise it's not published that I'm aware of. Uh, we found out that at looking at the pharmacogenomic reports that we were tracking in his study, that uh, the compliance with the recommendations were astoundingly poor. So these are direct quotes from his uh, discussion, which was chapter 7.2. Uh, as expected, a significantly higher proportion of the studied population 
exhibited non uh, uh, poor metabolite, uh, more non uh, well extensive metabol extensive phenotypes compared to poor metabolizer phenotypes. So 97.5% were extensive metabolizers of clopidogrel, uh, an antiplatelet drug, versus two and a half percent that were uh, poor metabolizers. That's what we would expect. However, clopidogrel is black box warning that it should be not used in people that are poor metabolizers because it's not active and you get no antiplatelet effect. So the clopidogrel discontinuation rates were not significantly different in our study between the poor metabolizers and the non-poor metabolizer subjects. The poor, poor metabolizer subjects should have had 100% discontinuation. They actually had 2.3 within 90 days. Now we can't see why somebody thought they wanted to discontinue the drug. All we can see is whether or not they kept prescribing it and getting it filled at a pharmacy. 2.3% discontinued the drug. It should have been 100%. So pharmacogenomic data combined with phenoconversion corrections require clear recommendations and prescriber education of how to interpret and implement the recommendations or they will not be useful. Okay, that's all I've got today. Thank you very much for listening and I will unshare my screen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sacklad. You're, you're really, you're an excellent psychopharmacologist. We're glad to have you and, and thanks for applying some real world examples there. So I'm gonna try sharing my screen here. Let's see if technology plays nicely. And um, somebody give me a word of confidence that you can see the GenMed Pro screen here. We can see it then. Great. Okay, so um, did everyone have the opportunity to memorize all of Dr. Sacklad's charts right there? He said this will be on the test. Well, um, I know the answer to that is no, because I do this every day and I can't uh, remember all of those charts. Um, by the way, if anyone has any questions, you'll notice that there's a Q&A feature within Zoom. So uh, feel free to put your questions in there. We will have a Q&A session at the end of this, but you can put them in there right now. We'll try to get it to as many questions as possible. Um, so going back to the, um, you know, these charts, all these charts that were listed there, this is, suffice it to say, these are, these are complicated interactions, right? These drug-drug interactions married to these drug-gene interactions, um, coupled with the fact that many people don't know what to do with pharmacogenomic information when they have it. And some people, as Dr. Sackler just showed, will ignore that information when they have access to it. Um, with all that in mind, we built this drug gene interaction software, which is called GenMed Pro. You may know it as GDIG if you've been with us um, in the past. Uh, GDIG has been rebranded. We've added some new bells and whistles to it. So what I want to do is show you how all of these different aspects, all of these different parameters contribute um, to give you a, a composite picture of how these drugs and genes interact with each other. Just to kind of get us started here, let's use one of um, Dr. Sacklad's examples. So remember that he was talking about clozapine. Now, with GenMed Pro, your genetic profile will always be included with the interaction check. This one happens to have everyone set it normal, but we'll change that in a second. Let me orient you to the tool first. Here's clozapine. We're gonna do exactly what happened in real life, and we're gonna add fluvoxamine to this. And you'll notice that you now have a up arrow, which is a prediction of blood levels or a prediction in area under the curve, a prediction of your exposure to this medication. And when you mix these two medications together, you expect an increase in clozapine exposure. What kind of increase? Well, a pretty significant increase. You can see that we use icons and these icons include high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. Um, what we're really saying with these high risk is interactions is this is something you really want to double check. You probably want to consider different medications or adjusting dosages in this person. So clozapine by itself in this individual looks pretty good. You add fluvoxamine and that's 
a much different story. Um, you'll notice if you look at the interaction details here, it will summarize all of the interactions that are contributing to this increased exposure. So in this scenario, we know that CYP182 is a primary pathway, 2D6 is a secondary pathway, 3A4 is secondary, p -like a protein is secondary. All of these things can influence clozapine exposure. And if you look at fluvoxamine, it does a little bit of everything. It inhibits CYP1A2 strongly. It inhibits CYP2D6 a little bit. It inhibits 3A4 a little bit. But when you, when you throw all this together, it results in a pretty dramatic expected increase in clozapine exposure. So that's a drug-drug interaction. Um, Dr. Sacklett also mentioned uh, thiothixine. So by itself, and this person looks pretty good, in the pre presence of Tegretol, one of the world's most potent inducers, you can see to expect a dramatic decrease in the thiothixine levels. All right, so this is a tool, these two examples matched what Dr. Sacklett saw in a couple of real life examples. And again, this would be considered a major interaction. And we also wanna identify what we call the problem child, what drug is most responsible for the most significant interactions. In this case, it would be Tegretol. We would probably clean up this drug-drug interaction the most if we got rid of Tegretol. That's useful if you have a list of eight or nine medications and you wanna know which medication is, is the biggest problem. So couple, that was a couple examples of drug-drug interactions. What we really want to focus on is the combination of drug-drug and drug-gene interactions, this concept of phenoconversion. And just to summarize what our speaker said, phenoconversion is the mismatch between your genotype and your phenotype. So let's, give, let's provide an example here, which everyone is probably comfortable with. Um, I've created a genetic profile of a 2D6 poor metabolizer, a PM. This is a person who does not make 2D6 enzyme. Let's give them a little aripiprazole. And we expect that to be a problem, increase in exposure, and it's a pretty significant problem. Okay, great, what do I do about that? Well, you might be surprised to know that there is guidance in the FDA label for this specific genotype. And if you were to open the FDA label, the guidance would say, administer 50% of your standard dose, of your usual dose. Now, if you're treating schizophrenia, that's a different standard dose than if you were using this as uh, antidepressant augmentation. Whatever your standard dose you were prepared to give, the recommendation is to cut that by 50%. The FDA label goes a step further and it says, oh, by the way, if this person is a poor metabolizer and you give them a strong 3A4 inhibitor, reduce the dose by a full 75%, okay? If you go up here and look at our piprazole, you'll see that 2D6 is a primary pathway, but 3A4 is a secondary pathway along with p-glycoprotein. So if 2D6 is dead, like it is in this person, the, every, everything gets shunted to the 3A4 pathway then. So we need to be concerned because 3A4 then has a more dramatic effect in these people. So this tool, this GenMed Pro tool, takes all of these different scenarios into account. Drug-drug and drug-gene interactions. Okay, so here is the FDA guidance. There's a, um, everyone is probably familiar with CPIC. Dr. Sacklad mentioned them. Um, we didn't talk about DPWG yet, but DPWG is a consortium of European researchers that also make guidelines. So in this example, the recommendation is reduce the aripiprazole dose by 67 to 75% of your standard dose and no more than 10 milligrams daily. So all of these links here are live. They will bring you to the actual FDA label. They will bring you to the actual DPWG site. If we had a CPIC guideline, it would bring you to the CPIC guideline. I'll use paroxetine as an example. In 2D6 poor metabolizers, the CPIC guideline is to choose a different drug. But if you're going to use paroxetine, cut your dose by 50%.
and the link is live, it brings you right to the CPIC guideline here. Okay, so this is what you do in a genetic poor metabolizer. Let's look at phenoconversion here. Let's assume this person was normal. You know, 2D6 was normal. You would look at your pharmacogenetic report and say, oh, no problem with paroxetine. In fact, I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna change this back to Abilify. Okay, you have a normal metabolizer. You decide to give someone some aripiprazole. You're looking at your genetic report and you're saying, oh, great, no problems here. This person is a normal metabolizer. What you failed to remember is that this person is also on fluoxetine, which happens to be a potent 2D6 inhibitor. Look what happens to aripiprazole now. It's the same output as if you were a poor metabolizer. Increase in exposure, high risk, okay? So fluoxetine, even though this person's genetics is completely normal, normal 2D6 metabolism, their phenotype is equivalent to a poor metabolizer. So again, phenoconversion is that mismatch between your genotype and your phenotype. And if you go back a few years back, one of the big criticisms of pharmacogenetics was, was this concept of phenoconversion. In fact, I remember reading an article saying, uh, phenoconversion is the Achilles heel of pharmacogenetics because if you just look at the genes, you are missing significant drug-drug interactions that will convert people into poor metabolizers. We're trying to capture all of that in this tool right here. Okay, um, let's go back here to aripiprazole. Let's put them back on fluoxetine. Um, what we may be saying to ourselves here is, well, aripiprazole doesn't look like a, a great choice right here. It would be nice to know what other medications presented a lower risk. Well, you can click this alternative medications tab and it will provide you a list of similar medications ranked by any drug drug or drug gene interactions. So here's all your second gens right here listed by the risk of interaction. Rexalt, Brexpiprazole is still a problem. Iloperidone, Risperidone still a problem. But quetiapine looks pretty clean here because quetiapine goes through the 3A4 pathway. If we replace our piprazole with quetiapine, we've created a cleaner drug interaction profile. You know, maybe, maybe you love Abilify and you wanna stick with the Abilify. Well, what other SSRIs might present a cleaner profile here? And it looks like escitalopram is probably a little cleaner. So either you can go in either direction, but this, this tool will provide you information on all the similar medications within a family. So you can try to minimize drug interactions. Um, one more example here uh, I'd like to show you. We talked a little bit about clozapine before. Let's take a look at olanzapine, okay? Let's change this individual's genetics. Take a look at olanzapine. Um, olanzapine here by itself looks pretty good. No major change in exposure is expected, but we know that smoking or excessive coffee consumption can change your exposure to olanzapine. So if we were to click smoking right here, we see that that changes your exposure to olanzapine, okay? It's a drug-drug and drug-gene interaction layered on top of each other. This gene by itself, this CYP1A2 gene by itself is normal, but it sensitizes you to induction. So by itself, we don't expect any major issues with olanzapine, but in the presence of smoking, in the presence of an inducer, then we expect a moderate decrease in serum levels. Same thing with coffee consumption, greater than three cups of coffee per day. Um, same thing with something like St. John's Ward, if I can spell it here. Now St. John's Ward can cause a decrease because of its induction of 1A2 also. So those are really the main, um, 
the main interactions and drug gene scenarios I wanted to show right here. Um, I think in the next 10 minutes, we'll do some Q&A, and then we can always go back to this and run some different scenarios if people are interested. So um, I'd like to invite back Dr. Sacklad. Uh, I'd like to invite back Dr. Krauss, and let's go through some of these Q&A questions here. Hey, Dan, let me, can I just interject something here, please? Um, first of all, those, those two talks went really well together, and I think that your follow-up was tremendous to Dr. Sacklad's introductory talk. For those of you who haven't seen GenMed Pro before, Genomine offers consultations, and the consultations can be specific to a patient, or they can be general consultations. And so I promise you that if you see GenMed Pro a few times, it looks a little complicated at first. It is incredibly easy and intuitive to use, and we can help to walk you through it so that you will be totally comfortable with it. Um, we're recording this so that we will make this available to you for digestion later or to colleagues. Um, okay, so um, I have some questions, but I think there are some questions from some members of the audience. If you don't mind, Dan, I'll just take, I'll just read the first one, which is from Dr. Chepke. Dr. Sakai, can you talk about the dose dependency of inhibition of CYP450 enzymes? For example, in someone who's a 2D6 extensive metabolizer, what dose of bupropion would one expect to convert them into an IM? What dose would convert them to a PM? As far as I know, all of these interactions do have a dose dependency. However, I believe that there's a tremendous amount of inter-individual variation on the amount of medication you would need to take to be able to induce the interaction. And to be honest, I have never seen, I'm not sure I've looked, uh, but I've never seen a paper that looked at what the dose dependency was for enzyme inhibition from bupropion. Uh, does any, either of the other folks on, do, do you know if there's a, a paper on that? You're, you're likely to see maximum inhibition at 300 or more of bupropion. Right, but I don't know what what gets you to intermediate. Right. So we we can certainly look into the exact, you know, if there's an exact formula for bupropion, but um, bupropion is an example where there is a dose dependency. Some of these other medications, the dose doesn't matter all that much. Um, you know, ketoconazole, for example, you're pretty much irreversibly killing that enzyme regardless of your ketoconazole dose. So that wasn't the perfect answer to your question, Dr. Chepke, um, but um, in the case of bupropion, there is a dose dependency, but at 300 milligrams, consider that person a poor metabolizer. I, I would expect uh, that if we actually had low enough dosing, we could see dose dependency, even in a situation where you're looking at um, a, a interaction like ketoconazole, which completely blows away uh, CYP3A4 at low doses. But if we went down lower and lower and lower, we'd begin to see that dose dependency. But at any usable dose, it's gone. You're, you're over the threshold instantly. Um, I imagine that if you used a low enough dose of bupropion, you'd be an intermediate. But I have seen the interaction for sure. And most of the time I'm at 300 a day. Hey, Sorry, Tim. Well, there was a, just a follow up on one of these other questions. There was a question in there regarding clopidogrel or, or Plavix. Mm -hmm. So in regard to Dr. Sacklad's example earlier, um, one of the important considerations here when we're looking at these interactions is to understand this concept of a, of a prodrug. You know, what do we mean by a prodrug? Well, clopidogrel is, and I'm using the brand name here, Plavix, but clopidogrel is a prodrug which means most medications get metabolized into an inactive uh, substance or a less active uh, metabolite. Plavix is just the opposite. It gets converted into the active form. So that's what we mean by prodrug. So in the context of a poor metabolizer, you're not converting Plavix to its more active form. In this case, it's 2C19. Um, the poor metabolizer, 
2C19 poor metabolizers do not make 2C19. They can't convert the Plavix to the active blood thinning or platelet um, um, preventing metabolite. So to answer your question, yes, for most drugs, a poor metabolizer would increase your exposure to Plavix. And it does increase your exposure to the parent compound. But in the case of Plavix, we don't care about the parent compound. All we care about is the metabolite and poor metabolizers can't make that metabolite. You can see this little icon next to Plavix in this case, where we highlight that it is a pro drug. The other classic example here would be codeine. So mm -hmm. here we take codeine by itself, you know, all genes being equal. Um, codeine, we expect standard treatment, but in a poor metabolizer, you cannot convert codeine to morphine. And the most recent CPIC guideline says, avoid codeine, avoid tramadol in these people who are poor metabolizers. So I hope that answers that. Uh, I, 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 could I just throw in that I believe that might be one of the problems with uh, my grad student, uh, Dr. Hunter's, uh, Hunter's study was that it was a pro drug and they got back the report that said that it was poorly metabolized and that was confusing. And instead of asking what to do or the report explaining it well enough that they could understand it because the report was multiple pages of dense text. I think that they looked at it and said, I don't know what that means. And right. they didn't do anything. So, you know, part of, part of what we built into this is to, to um, alleviate that problem. So if you got a report back and it said poor metabolizer, you may say, well, what do I do with it? The CPIC guideline is crystal clear. Use an alternative antiplatelet therapy. Use Prasugril or Ticag Ticagrelor. Uh, the FDA label says something very similar. The DPWG guidelines is very similar. So we recognize that these uh, interactions can be complicated, but the guidelines are, are designed to you know, give you, give you the, the take home message, which is what you see here. Use something else in this patient. Uh, Dr. Sacklett, I have a question. Uh, you talked about blocking enzyme pathways, and you mentioned the number of ways in which enzyme pathways can be blocked. Is it possible to overwhelm an enzyme with multiple substrates? Yes, uh, depending on, okay, uh, one of the things I describe CYP2D6 as is like a two-lane country road. It doesn't take a whole lot to block that. If you have somebody with a flat tire, you're slowing up traffic because they can't get around you. 3A4, on the other hand, is like an eight lane superhighway. There's, there's a lot of capacity. It takes a lot more to substrate overload 3A4 than it does 2D6. If you actually give enough of the same compound, I'm not sure you can practically do this with any drug, but if you give more and more of the compound, you will see that the metabolic rate going through 2D6 goes to a maximum and shuts down. Um, phenytoin exhibits this property uh, quite reliably. It has a number of metabolic pathways that are saturable and it has a certain VMAX, a certain ma mass, I can't talk, a certain maximum dose that you're able to give a phenytoin. And that's the maximum your body can metabolize. If you gave one more milligram of phenytoin per day, it would increase their amount in the body, their AUC by one milligram per day forever. Um, and you can see people making mistakes on phenytoin all the time because of its non-linear michaelis minton pharmacokinetics. I'm not sure I answered your question, but I think I did. No, that was very clear. So it's somewhat family dependent. Family dependent, and it also depends on which isoform of the uh, pathway you have. Okay, um, Dan, we have a question about when do you use the term normal metabolizer versus uh, extensive metabolizer? That's a good question. So um, it might be about a year ago, maybe longer than that, that CPIC created a standardization project, a terminology standardization project. Um, and part of this standardization project was to call what we 
normally call extensive metabolizers to change that term to normal metabolizers because it's more intuitive. So yes, um, extensive metabolizer, which is normal, means the same exact thing as a normal metabolizer. Um, unfortunately, those have been using pharmacogenetics for a, a long time. The term EM is very sticky. Um, I think it's probably a good recommendation that we internally change it to normal metabolizer for consistency. So um, I'll put that on my to-do list, but they are equivalent. EM equals NM. Okay, well, it's one o'clock exactly. So I wanna thank Dr. Sacklad and Dr. Dowd. I think this was um, very illustrative. I always learn something uh, and, and I did today as well. So we will make this talk available on YouTube, I believe. As Dr. Sackler noted, we'll make the slides available to you in PDF format if you want them. Um, you can call Genomine at customer service. You can reach me. My email address is dkrause, K-R-A-U-S-E, at genomine.com. And uh, thank you for your attendance. I think it was a wonderful meeting. Have a good week, everybody.